Some months ago, a German television team contacted me because they had heard about my science challenge and had found a physicist at Georgetown University I could debate. They also wanted to make it as easy on the scientist as possible, so their idea was simple. They would record me on video, reading five quick science-based questions, and then send that recording over to Georgetown, and he would respond in kind. This is what I read on camera. One, long-distance photography. The mainstream science formula for the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared. An easy comparison would be the falling rate of 32 feet per second per second. So eight inches per mile per mile. Two miles is two times two equals four times eight inches or 32. Three miles is three times three equals nine times eight or 72 and so on. At 50 miles, the curvature is 50 times 50 times eight, coming in at over 1600 feet of curvature. And yet, with HD cameras, we can pull boats back into frame that are well beyond visual range. Not only does the new technology clearly show that it's not a mirage, but the same objects can be viewed in infrared and can be targeted ship to ship by beam radar. Can science explain this? They had no answer. Number two, vacuum versus gravity. The force of a vacuum is measured in units of tor, T-O-R-R. Even a low-level vacuum can overcome gravity here on the surface. In building molecule-free chambers for the manufacturing of electronics, a series of massive pumps are needed to create a 99% vacuum. That's negative nine tor. And for the remaining 1%, horsepower isn't enough. It can only be achieved by a chemical leaching process. That being said, how is the negative 10 tor vacuum force of space not ripping off the atmosphere of this world? What is gravity? Uh, and remember that there are gases that already defy it, like helium, hydrogen, and fluorocarbons. Isn't it more logical to suggest that the atmosphere is being contained in an enclosed, pressurized system? They had no answer. Number three, eclipse shadow. Mainstream science tells us that the moon is over 2,000 miles wide, and yet during the 2017 American eclipse, no offense, the moon's shadow was only 70 miles wide, a reduction of over 97%. This is what the equivalent of having a six-foot man walking in front of a wall where his shadow is smaller than an action figure at only two inches. Where do we see this in our everyday lives? We've seen a shadow's actual size and some much larger. Where can we see small shadows? The Flat Earth community says that the moon is less than 50 miles wide, much closer and the same size as the sun. Isn't this explanation also possible? They had no answer. Number four, moon temperature. Science has yet to address this relatively new discovery that the moon generates a cold light. We all know that in the daytime it is 90 degrees in the sunlight, 80 degrees in the shade, depending on the conditions. I know I'm, I'm not gonna do the Celsius conversion up here, sorry. Uh, however, at night, especially when the moon is high in the sky, we see the opposite. While it might be 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's warmer at 60 degrees in the moon's shade, sometimes showing temperature shifts of over 13 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, under controlled experiment conditions, magnified moonlight is even colder still, again, the opposite of sunlight. We can generate this with technology today using a cold laser. The question is, why is the moon giving off a cold laser light? They had no answer. Last but not least, the Van Allen belts. A simple yes or no question. Are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? If yes, then how did Apollo 11 through 17 make round trips through these belts with only aluminum and plastic as shielding? No one died, no one got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. I think there's still like five left. Radiation is only stopped by two metals, lead and gold. Both are very heavy and cannot be used in aerospace because of their weight. If the answer is no, the belts are not deadly, then explain the video currently on the NASA.gov website called Orion Trial by Fire, in which NASA clearly states that the belts are so dangerous they will not be testing manned capsules because they are unable to solve the radiation problem. Keep in mind, this is not an old video. It was created at the end of 2014. The scientist viewed my recording 
and folded like a card table. This piece was never aired. All that being said, my name is Mark Kendall Sargent, and I'm a flat earther. Flat Earth is my passion, it is my obsession, and it is now my life. I watched my very first Flat Earth video in the summer of 2014. Like many of you, I quietly laughed at it, and then I made a huge mistake. I casually thought I could debunk it, then realized it wasn't so easy. I rolled up my sleeves and tried to shut it down for nine months, and then I failed. Confused, irritated, and mildly depressed, I then published my very first Flat Earth video on February 10th, 2015, with my full name, address, and phone number, prepared for the ridicule that would inevitably follow. The video, called Flat Earth Clues, simply stated what I saw and prompted people to do their own research and ask questions. The phone rang almost immediately. A person on the other, the, on the other end of the phone said, tell me more. Then another call came, and another, and then the emails, and the texts. I couldn't tell what the attraction was, but for whatever reason, it was resonating, so I kept generating content. Fast forward to this morning. I've done 80 videos dedicated to answering emails, 84 Flat Earth and other hot potato shows with Patricia Steer, 159 weekly Strange World shows, over 1,200 Flat Earth videos in total. Since my phone number was very easy to find, I received calls for interviews, and I did everything I could to accommodate them, no matter who they were. I've talked to everyone from junior high newspapers to major networks, and I do my best to treat them all the same. I set my feet, keep my cool, and do whatever I can to plant the seed in their head. If they want, into lay, if they want to lay into me, I smile. If they give me an opening, I create momentum. I try to kill them with kindness, honey over vinegar. And if they give me enough time, my message will get into their head. Look into Flat Earth, do your own research, ask questions. And yes, seeds were planted. Every video that I made, every interview that I sat for was viewed by people who talked to other people and eventually it circled back around. I honestly thought the first one was a fluke. I was in Atlanta, Georgia sitting in the audience as Zen Garcia was engaged in a theological flat earth debate. Because that's a thing now. We took a break for lunch and I went over to the closest restaurant I could find, a sports bar in the same parking lot. The bartender, a woman in her late 20s, overheard us talking in the corner. She came over and asked me directly if we were into flat earth. I said yes and she said, high five. The next day I flew out from Atlanta. My carry-on was going through a second screening and I was wearing a I am Mark Sargent t-shirt. A young Homeland Security man pointed at my bag and then me. He then kept staring at my shirt and my eyes. Back and forth he did this until finally he asked quietly, yo, you Mark Sargent for reals? I said yes. He winked at me, handed, my, handed me my bag without opening it and said, that's my name too. He knew the Fight Club reference. We may not all be Mark Sargent, but we are all Flat Earth. I was at a recent salt and sea test in Southern California, and after an exhausting morning with skeptics, National Geographic, and a whole bunch of Flat Earthers, we met up at an organic cafe in Palm Springs. The cashier, who eventually figured out what we were doing at our tables, then showed us the anything but secret hand sign. You see, she was one of us. Despite what you may hear, we do have people everywhere. That same trip, I was out to dinner with a few people from the meetup. Patricia Steer received an invitation for drinks at the weekend home of a Hollywood icon. We went, along with Rob Skiba, and found out that the Flat Earth grapevine reached much further than publicly reported. When I got back to Whidbey Island, that's in Washington, by the way, if you guys didn't know, I walked past a construction crew. A young man was staring at me from a distance and then approached. He asked me if I was that guy from Flat Earth. Keep in mind, this is a rural island in the corner of the United States. That very evening, and I cannot make this up, my cousin called me from Manhattan. 
She was there in a wine bar with executives from one of the biggest Wall Street hedge funds in the world. One of them brought up Flat Earth. She mentioned my name. And not only did they know the clues, they insisted on sending me a picture of them next to a phone with an AE map on it. Only one other person in this room has seen that picture. My point, and I'm repeating myself for the documentary team who did not believe me, is that we have people everywhere. At first, I thought Flat Earth was like the Spice Girls, who, even though they sold 80 million albums, almost no one was willing to admit that they owned it. The truth about Flat Earth is that we're much bigger than the Spice Girls. Currently, the majority of our membership is in the closet. For every one of you here, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, with the same information and the same awakening. Think that's an exaggeration for the media that's here? A recent article inside Russia said that at least 3%, and these are the ones that admitted it, of Russians believe in the flat earth. If that low ball number is true, that's over 4 million people, 4 million flat earthers just in Russia. They stand quietly and watch from the outside, waiting for the moment when mainstream makes it something to talk about without ridicule. For the community members who are on the front lines, and there's a bunch of them here, taking the hits day after day, I salute all of you. Just look at the amazing work these people have done in just three years. D. Marble got on an airplane with a spirit level, and he made national news. His channel now grows every day. Nathan Thompson has the largest Flat Earth Facebook group in the country. Patricia Steer has put herself out there on camera doing over 250 Flat Earth and other hot potato shows. Globebusters averages over a thousand live viewers in a hangout, something that many globalist YouTube channels would be envious of. Celebrate Truth, who I have heard is Canadian, he is at 98,000 subscribers. Oh, and in his spare time, he organizes first-of-its-kind conventions like this. Jaronism has grown to over 113,000 subs. Rob Skiba is 145,000. Controversy 7, another Canadian, is at 151,000. ODD Reality is at 185,000. And there are many, many more. Too many, in fact, to mention here. Keep in mind that these aren't video game or makeup or food channels. Like Sparta, this is Flat Earth. All of these channels and this massive wall of content has affected almost everyone else in the social media. In the last year, the ripples from our members have spilled over into the YouTube titans. And they have responded, some positive, some negative, but the exposure is priceless and the numbers staggering. Star Talk, one video, 2.3 million views. This morning in UK, one video, 2.8 million. Jimmy Kimmel, 3.7 million. Rich Ferguson, 4.4 million. Joe Rogan, 5 million. PewDiePie, the largest YouTube channel in the world, did not one but two Flat Earth videos at 6 million hits each. Space Videos, which is a dedicated 24-7 science live stream, now has to put debunk Flat Earth in their title. And it does nothing but create more awareness for Flat Earth. Thank you for that. Naiga Haiga generated 15 million hits in one Flat Earth video in April of last year. And Shane Dawson generated 15 million Flat Earth hits, and he did it June of this year. I remember in the fall of 2015 and how cool it was that Forbes magazine even mentioned the words Flat Earth in an article. Now if I don't see a news story every other day, I feel let down. That's how media spoiled we've become. In fact, it was one of these recent articles by U.gov, a British media research company, that got the attention of National Geographic. You see, they had polled over 8,200 Americans and asked them about the shape of the Earth. And the number that stood out? The 18 to 24 year olds. Over a third of them were skeptical of the official story that we lived in a spinning rock flying through empty, meaningless space. That study was the first wake-up call for science who, up until now, has just dismissed the people involved because our numbers didn't present a threat. Now, at least some of them know differently. And for the rest of the scientific community, I come bearing a message. I like science. I always have. I flew here on the back of science. And I am speaking to you now on the fruits of its labor. Science, however, was never intended to be a religion. And that's what you've turned it into. You've turned it into scientism. You've taken the faith that people have in your lab coats and you've turned it against them, pushing concepts and products onto the population which can be harmful or just simply untrue. 
You've taken what should have been simple observations and twisted them to suit your needs and make us feel small. We're not small and we're not an accident. In fact, we are the new scientists and we're heading straight for you. You don't want to defend yourself? Fine. Any ground you're not currently standing on? It's ours. We'll take the cities, we'll take the suburbs, we'll take the countryside. We've already been winning this war by attrition because you didn't think we were worth it. You want to call us a social media virus? Well, at least you got one thing right. We are infectious. We're currently the most interesting concept in the world. We're easy to understand and we open minds. Oh, and one more thing. As you sit there in your offices, wringing your hands because you don't want to risk that vaulted education of yours, we've been running around your flanks at speed for the last three years. In closing, I'd like to circle back around. My name is Mark Kendall Sargent, and I'm a flat earther. Every day, I try to set an example for the community. I make content, I do interviews, I fly to meetups, I place stickers, I leave bookmarks. My car has a license plate that says it's flat. Even my gaming guild is named Flat Earth. When I'm awake, I'm trying to figure out new ways to plant the seed, and I absolutely will not stop until Flat Earth has changed this world for the better, because that's what we all deserve, a better world. <laughs> Long live Flat Earth. Thank you.